Hi, and welcome to Dr. Vanderveen's AP Chemistry Podcast. Today we're talking about half-life. Now, half-life is a way of talking about the rate of reactions. What I'd like to do is start by defining the term, making sure you understand the concept. So when we talk about half-life, we're talking about the amount of time that has to elapse in order for the concentration of a reactant to reach one-half its initial value. So let's say we started with 100 grams of a particular reactant. Well, eventually, it would get down to 50 grams, and the amount of time that it takes is one half-life. Eventually, the 50 grams would get down to 25 grams, and the amount of time this takes is another half-life. So to get from 100 grams to 25 grams in this example, two half-lives have elapsed. And we can keep going on like this. Now the half-life uh, of a reaction is a measure really of how quickly it's going. If a reaction is very fast, its half-life will be short. It didn't take long to get from 100 grams to 50 grams. And if it's a very long um, half-life, that's telling you that the reaction is pretty slow. Now half-life turns out to be a very easy way to describe first-order reactions. And one of the most common first-order reactions that chemistry students will encounter deals with radioactive decay. So all the radioactive decay problems that you've done are actually first order decay problems and half-life is a, as you may recall, a really common way of talking about these. So let's go ahead and talk about half-lives of a first order process, whether you're doing nuclei or some other first process. The general expression for the half-life is that it's equal to a constant 0.693 over k. Now this is really coming eventually ultimately from the integrated rate law where the 0.693 is the ln of 2 and k of course is the rate constant and if it's a first order process the rate constant will have units of inverse seconds or inverse time and so the t1 half is also going to be a t time unit. Now what I wanted to point out to you, from this equation, you'll notice the only things in it are the half-life and the rate constant. And of course, rate constant depends only on temperature. So what this is telling us is that the half-life for a first-order reaction does not depend on the starting concentration. It's completely independent of that. It depends only on the rate constant, which of course depends on temperature. So the half-life of a first-order process it's constant. Right? And you might remember from radioactive decay problems that you know, we have tables of half-lives for different reactions and they can vary for these first order processes from fractions of seconds to billions of years depending on whatever substance is undergoing the first order decay. And that's characteristic of nuclear reactions. I wanted to show this to you graphically as well. Here we have a first order reaction, we're told it's first order, and the reactant is a gas, and we're looking at pressure units. So we started at 150 torr, and eventually it drops down to 75 torr, and at the concentration at seven, uh, of 75 torr took about, I don't know, 13,000 seconds to get from the initial 150 torr down to half of that. Right? So one half-life has elapsed. As the reaction continues, the reactant concentration will drop. Half of 75 is 37.5. Right? And if we look again, it took again about 13,000 seconds for half of the remaining 75 torr to react and go away. Um, so this is constant. Right, T1 half is constant for first order processes. And that's characteristic of first order processes. It's not true for other reaction orders. So let's go on and talk about second order reactions. Right. Um, but the constant value of T1 half makes it really useful for first order. Now if you have a second order reaction, the half life depends on the reactant concentrations, which means it's going to be changing as the reaction takes place. So for a second order reaction from the integrated rate law, we can say that the half-life is equal to 1 over the rate constant 
times that initial concentration of the reactant. But of course, every time you have a new half-life, every time you get that 50% decay, well, it's now a different concentration. So the half-life is always going to be changing in a second-order reaction. All right, so let's go on and look at a couple of problems. Now, these are problems from Brown, Sidlow, and uh, Brown, LeMay, and Burston, the 10th edition. Um, and we are told that for this particular decomposition reaction, which we're given here, that this reaction is first order in SO2Cl2 at 600 Kelvin. The half-life for this process is 2.3 times 10 to the fifth seconds. What is the rate constant? Well, we know that the half-life is equal to 0.693 over the rate constant. Well, we could rearrange this easily. We want to know the rate constant. So the rate constant is equal to 0.693 over the half-life. At this point, it becomes a substitute and evaluation situ situation. Over 2.3 10 to the fifth seconds. All right, so I'm going to do 0.693. That's what it says there, even though it's messy. 0.693 divided by 2.3 times 10 to the fifth. I get an answer of 3.0 times 10 to the minus 6 per second. Now, this is a first order process. And we remember that first order processes have rate constants with units of inverse seconds, so that's reasonable here. And it's uh, got a fairly long half-life, which would be reasonable for having a small uh, rate constant, so this seems okay to me. Uh, unless I've made a silly math error, which is certainly more than possible. I don't think I have, though. So let's go on and look at another problem. I want to be able to do basic problems involving half-life. Now, you'll notice here that I have changed the temperature. Now we're at 320 degrees Celsius. Um, so the rate constant now is 2.2 times 10 to the fifth per second. It's the same reaction, so we're still first order. And the question is, asks, what is the half-life? All right, well, we know that half-life is equal to 0.693 over the rate constant. We know the rate constant, so we just need to substitute and evaluate. So I'll just write everything in. All right, and so I get out my handy dandy calculator 0.693 divided by 2.2 times 10 to the minus fifth. I get an answer of 31,500 seconds. Of course, I'm only six, really, so we'll round that off to 32,000 seconds. Well, I hope you found this helpful. I hope you realize that half-life problems are generally pretty easy to do. And remember, if it's first order, the half-life is constant. That can be a very handy thing to remember.